welcome everyone, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleague, colleagues and, and, and friends. Uh, it's, it's great to see um, so many of you here today uh, to uh, celebrate uh, Mary Ryan's um, inaugural lecture at the, uh, of the Armors and Brazers. So my name is Sandrine Hines, I'm the Head of Department um, of Materials and I get the great job to do this introduction and, and, and also um, keep you safe. So uh, the first thing to say is uh, uh, please notice the fire exits over there and at the back as well and there are no planned um, uh, tests here so uh, hopefully it, it won't rain. Um, so, so yeah, great to see um, so many of you here. Today Mary will tell us about um, small things matter. Uh, no doubt she will make reference to the things that happen at the nanoscale, i.e. very small. Um, indeed, she is a prominent figure um, in nanomaterials and nanotechnology, uh, with dis discoveries impacting corrosion, energy, healthcare, and more. So uh, we look forward to hearing about that. But it is also an extremely apt title um, for someone who has given so much to the wider field of science and engineering and generally um, supported and mentored others in the department and beyond. Indeed, no cause is too small uh, for Mary and we are incredibly grateful to her for her commitment and contributions that you will hear about um, in the vote of thanks. So today we're celebrating her chair from uh, the Armors and Brazers, which is the first ever chair awarded by the company and uh, to commemorate its 700th anniversary um, this year. The department enjoys a long-standing link with the Armors and Brazers uh, from outreach um, to other supports through um, education and grants. Um, and uh, these activities were set up by my predecessors, Bill Lee, Neil Alford, and of course, uh, Peter Haynes, who was uh, responsible for uh, instrumental in, in setting up this chair as well. Um, so, uh, to, to, to tell us more about um, um, all, of, all of these uh, wonderful um, uh, you know, links and, and, and the wonderful um, uh, company here, um, I now invite the master of the Amazon Embracer, uh, Jonathan Hale, to come and say a few words um, about the creation of the chair and uh, Mary's appointment. So please, Jonathan Hale, um, please come and uh, join us here. And, uh, <laughs> Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for that. I, I, it puzzled because when I was a student, albeit not here, um, I didn't get so much attention. I didn't think students paid much attention to the person at the front of the um, <laughs> front of the uh, auditorium. Anyway, so the armor is uh, 700 years old this year. Um, as its name implied, we started making armor, and we had 300 very good years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> helped helped by little things like the Hundred Years' War and <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, so that was all very good. Uh, and it lasted until some unfortunate person invented the rifled musket, um, whereupon armor making went into a reverse. Um, in a pathetic attempt to stay relevant, we merged with the braziers in about 1710. Unfortunately, as many of you know, brass making, brass joining is very easy. So while the armorer's role in life was to uh, have standards and train people and apprentices, hard to do that with brass. You, any, anybody could do it in their, in their back, backyard. So, so that wasn't a very good idea. Then we, then we became essentially a drinking club in Victorian times, <laughs> which is not, not the best, greatest period of our history. Um, and then in the 20th century, we reinvented ourselves to say this is ridiculous just to be drinking. Um, so we became uh, supporters of metallurgy um, in schools, universities, and early careers. And then in the 21st century, we've moved that on to materials, because as you will be very well aware, metallurgy is quite a narrow field. Materials com um, crosses over metallurgy and many other things. Um, so we support um, material science across a range of institutions, including Imperial. Um, the idea of the uh, chair uh, came about as something to permanently represent our 700th year. Um, and uh, Imperial won against a very illustrious mixture of other universities. And I think Imperial won because of the responsiveness of the Department of Materials to what we were looking for. Um, I think also the values that the department had and also our long as association with um, Imperial. We, we were party to setting up the, um, uh, the sitting guilds in 1878. So we've, we've known Imperial for a very long time. Um, 
having decided that Imperial was the right place, then the question is, who should be the professor? And um, I well remember um, Bill Bonfield coming back to the court of the armourers, which is the equivalent of the board of directors, bubbling with enthusiasm about our chosen candidate, Professor Ryan. Um, you know, brilliant, committed, uh, wonderful ambassador for material science, which is everything we were looking for. Um, and, it, and about uh, a couple of months after Bill came back saying we found this wonderful person, uh, Mary came to the court and we met her. And she's all of those things. That was a, a very good introduction. Um, you know, and, and as many of you know, she's um, interested in many different areas, battery tech, nanotech, healthcare, um, Dornier bombers. I mean, how could, you, how could you not be interested in one of those? Um, so we're hugely looking forward to working with Mary over the next many years. Um, so anyway, without further, I'd like to present Mary Ryan, please, to talk about Small Things Matter. <laughs> thinking I should keep this very short, lest I don't live up to, to those introductions. Thank you very much, Sandrine. I wasn't expecting you to make me cry quite this early in the evening. But um, thank you. So yes, thank you to Sandrine and Jonathan. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be giving this lecture um, and to be holding this inaugural chair for the Armourers and Braziers. Um, those of you that are not in materials might not realise that, I guess, the warmth and respect that the company is held in, in the community, and the amount of work and advocacy and sponsorship that, that goes directly through the Armas and Braziers. So thank you. Um, it's, it's a great honor. And here we are in the City and Guilds Lecture Theatre, um, which is a fitting place to be delivering. Um, thank you, Sandrine and Jonathan. So, yes, I was going to talk to you about Small Things Matter. Um, and as with all kind of lectures like this, I also get to take some indulgence in, in giving you a little bit of I know my story, how we got here, um, and what matters to me, and how I do the science that I'm doing. So, this is this is me and my journey to um, the Armourers and Braziers chair, and I call it getting a proper job because um, since I started and left school, my family, not these immediate ones, although partly these immediate ones, um, my mum in particular was saying to me, "When are you going to get a proper job?" <laughs> um, anyway. Still waiting. Um, but I started in high school in West Yorkshire. It was in a, quite a deprived neighborhood. Um, it was the kind of school where you don't expect people, or kind of area where people you know, might struggle to get out. But my teachers were amazing. And there was, from day one, an expectation that I would do well, do exams, go to university, have a job. There was not even a question that I wouldn't, actually. And that expectation actually delivers Results. So I'm very grateful that I ended up in that school, in that place. I then went to the University of Manchester. You can see I went to the University of Manchester, and then UMIST, and then Manchester University. At some point in there was what we in London might call a takeover, but um, was a merger of institutions. So even though I've got three different degree places, really it's all in Manchester, and it was a fabulous place to be a student. And my first degree was a joint degree course in maths and physics. Um, if I was being a revisionist, I might say, well, I wanted the balance of the really analytical skill and understanding applied science and all the beauty of physics. In reality, I couldn't decide which to do. <laughs> so I thought I'd do a course that gave me both. And I actually spent three years of my life on that course avoiding experiments. Anytime there was an option to take a course that was just a theory course, I took it. I hated experiments. I don't want to do experiments. I'm avoiding them like the plague. Um, and then I got to the end of my degree, and there's a theme emerging. I don't know what I want to do. What shall I do? Nick, it's your fault. He came home with a, with a, with a pamphlet from UMIS, and it was a master's in materials. Why don't you think about this? Um, he, of course, had a career path and a plan. Um, and so I went to talk to them. I did a master's course. And on this course, which I loved, I had to do a project that was experimental. And, um, I used STM, and here's a picture of graphite in an STM. And the first time I did that, it was those experiments, and realized you could actually learn new things, and see new things. That's when, almost overnight, I became an experimentalist, and it turns out I really like experiments. So from there, I went to Brookhaven Labs, 
um, where I was basically doing a lot of X-ray work, so the National Synchrotron Light Source is there. It's very nice to have a, an X-ray synchrotron source 100 yards from your office. Um, so I got lots and lots of experience of doing synchrotron experiments, which came in quite handy lately, later. And my boss there, Hugh Isaacs, was very much do what you want, what experiments you want to do, what's interesting, go do it. It was great. Um, the funding situation helped. Department of Energy gave him some money. Came back three years later, what did you do with it? That's okay, have some more. <laughs> that's, that's not how it works here, but, um, but that was nice. Um, and then I came to Imperial College, London. Um, my mom, who died two years ago, still said, that's still not a proper job, Mary. What do you actually do? That's not a proper job. Anyway, I love not having a proper job, it turns out. So, this random walk through life, this lack of decision-making, has led most of the people in my family to describe me like this. Some people have those, live every day like it's your last. Mine has been, live like there is a tomorrow, right? Because some things can take time, and some things you need to take time over. And this kind of random walk was, was how I ended up here at Imperial in 1998. Um, and I have never wanted to leave. All right, so I'm going to talk about my PhD, and I think probably my PhD is one of the reasons I am the Armors and Brazers Chair. Um, so what you'll see here is lots of iron, lots of metalwork, and my PhD was on the passivation of metals, um, which is, trust me, more interesting than you think. Um, and, and really, it starts with um, understanding why metals are even exist and are stable as metals. Why can we create everything around us, our infrastructure, with metals, when to get the metal, you extract some ore, you put a ton of energy into it, you get a metal, it's hugely thermodynamically unstable. It right? shouldn't, shouldn't sit around as metal. It should be driven back to being oxide. And actually, Faraday, as in most things that we think about in electrochemistry, Faraday had already thought about some of this, and he and Sean by wrote letters to each other about some peculiar experiments he was doing, and he was actually the first person to describe this altered state of a surface, which he called passive. Um, so what that means is that, that, yes, the thermodynamics are a huge driving force, but the kinetics are so slow that actually you're going to take thousands of years to actually revert back to that native state. And he, he postulated that something on the surface was causing this. The surface state was altered. Um, and the surface was stopping the thermodynamics from winning in that scenario. And we later learned that there's a small, ultra-thin oxide on the surface of all metals except for gold um, that acts to stabilize that surface. Um, and then the question is, what is it? So when I started my PhD, there was a huge debate in the literature. Like, it was a huge debate. I know it was just all the corrosion people, but it was a huge debate <laughs> about whether this stuff is crystalline or amorphous. Right, and that might seem a pedantic point, but it's a really important point if you want to think about understanding stability of materials, right? At the same time, as I was just about to start my PhD, we were talking about burying nuclear waste and that we could model the behavior of a stainless steel canister for 10,000 years, but we didn't know what the surface was, all right? That's a crazy scenario to be in, actually. We're not having a fundamental understanding of the surface of a metal. So I had three years to work out whether they're crystalline or amorphous, um, I started with iron, and um, it's, it's crystalline, right. that's it. And I, you kind of go, okay. I wasn't quite arrogant enough just to put one picture in and say I've done, right there. <laughs> that probably wouldn't pass. But it's crystalline, and STM, this, this technique that we were using, showed that really clearly, right, it's a crystalline material. And so it turns out that isn't what's interesting about passive films, not the most interesting, anyway. What's the most interesting is that they're nanocrystalline. Right? So what does that mean? It means that we have these little ordered bunches of atoms in, in <coughs> grains, but they're ordered on a length scale of five to eight nanometers, right? Five to eight nanometers. So a human hair is something like 50 microns, right? So we're orders of magnitude smaller in these crystalline domains than a human hair. And so this STM, this is the one I just showed you. So this is, these are atoms all lined up, nicely crystalline. 
But actually, they're arranged in these little blobs that are about five nanometers. If you look at this bigger picture, you can see the outline here of the, gr the metal grain that's underneath. That's much bigger. And so we were able to understand, actually, how this structure forms by thinking about what is the metal doing in an environment. It's got a huge, a huge thermodynamic tendency to oxidize. So you get tons of nucleation sites on the surface, and they all grow a little bit and then stop because they're constrained. And then taking these data, we were able to show what the actual defect chemistry of those oxides are. And what you find is they're not the same as any bulk material. All right, so this brings us back to how do you model something for 10,000 years if one, you don't know what the structure is, but two, it's now different to all the stuff you're thinking it might be, right? It's a bit like magnetite, but not quite. It's got an interesting defect structure that actually stops transport in the system. And then we were able to do some in situ X-ray diffraction measurement. This is an X-ray diffraction peak. Um, it's a 004 peak, if you want to know, of the spinel structure. And we were able to see in situ, so in electrochemical cell, the film growing. And this, this peak width here, the materials people re recognize, tells us that it's nanocrystalline. And we can see how it grows with time. So the key question is, why did it take from Faraday to 1992? for us to understand what on earth does the surface of iron look like? And the main answer is, one, people used the wrong tools, partly because people used what they had or they thought they wanted to apply. Partly the tools didn't exist, all right? So STM didn't exist at that time. We could do diffraction, but it was very hard with the, 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 um, the flux that we had. Partly the fact that they were nanocrystalline confused people. So they were interpreting their data as amorphous or crystalline, and nothing quite fit because they weren't even thinking that there was this in-between nanophase. So they were not being open to different interpretations. And many of them did experiments ex situ, right? So this is a metal. It's got some altered state, as Faraday described, and you might have some stuff absorbed on it. That might just be water, or it might be other molecules. It might itself be dissolving. So this, this is dynamic, right? If you take it out, but you want to stop that process. But also, when you put a metal in a solution, you set up an electrochemical potential at the surface, right? And across this little oxide film here, there's about a million volts per centimeter electric field across this tiny, tiny, tiny film. And the only reason it can sustain that is because it's this really unusual structure, right? There isn't an iron oxide that you could dig out of the ground and do this with, that would be stable, right? So the nanocrystallinity is formed because of the thermodynamics, but then it prevents the thermodynamics from taking over. So this interesting paradox. But this people using the wrong tools to measure things is a recurring theme, I think, in the history of controversies in science. Okay, so one of the things we did in my group is um, spend a lot of time developing new ways to measure things. And when you're trying to measure things at the nanoscale, you've got to be very careful about what you're measuring and why, right? So you can say, well, I'm gonna measure the nanoscale properties of a bulk system, right? And that might be that it's nanocrystalline and I'm looking at where the grain boundaries are. You might look at an assembly of nano objects and hope that they're all the same. Or you might say, I'm gonna look at an individual nano object and that's a harder thing to do, right? And there are advantages and disadvantages of each of these length scales. If you've got lots of the system, your signal goes up, you'll get average information you'll have good statistics, but there might be one or two outliers in that assembly that was actually the interesting bit and you miss it. You come down to looking at individual objects, is that one thing you've managed to look at, an outlier, the sensitivity of your system, the measurement has to be much greater and the whole thing might be much more unstable. So you have to think carefully about what and how you're measuring things. Okay, so in doing this corrosion work, passivation of metals, we developed loads of techniques to study nano things carefully and in situ. At the same time as nanotechnology was going to be the next big thing. And I just want to point out the difference here between nanomaterials and nanotechnology, all right? So lots of nano is very, very old. You can go over to the V&A, and we've done it, and find in every gallery something that contains nanomaterials. Um, this is a pre-Columbian mask, you can see it looks gold. The 
The metal that's extracted from the ground looks copper colored. It's a copper gold alloy. You polish it with something acidic and it magically turns gold. This is stained, stained glass window from Norwich in England. There are older versions of stained glass all the way back to Roman times. This ruby red color here is because of gold nanoparticles in it. Um, and if you were able to look in here, of course they couldn't, you would see tiny little crystals, about 20 or so nanometers, that gives us this ruby red color. We now know that actually you can tune the size of the nanoparticles. Faraday also did this, by the way. Um, and tune the color. You can tune the optics by controlling the size. This um, de-alloying phenomena, it turns out, when you dissolve the copper out of copper gold, or the silver out of silver gold, you create nanoporous structures like this. And this is some beautiful data from one of my students, Eleanor. Um, and you can see this self-similar fractal dimension that you get. And this is driven by surface diffusion thermodynamics again, controlling what the pore size looks like. So if nanomaterials are old, what is new? So what is new is that actually now we can visualize nanoscale systems, we can measure them, and we can manipulate them. And those two things are intertwined, right? Visualizing and manipulating. So nanotechnology is the design, fabrication, application of nanostructures. All right, so instead of just having simple nanoparticles of gold, we can make really complex structures. So these gold nanostars, um, Rosalia made, are, have this incredible spiky structure. Looks a bit like Mr. Sneeze, I always think. Some of my students don't know what that is. But, um, and this is really interesting because it shifts the optics. It moves the optics to a place where you want it to be. And this spikiness gives it some really interesting mechanical properties in interacting with cell membranes, among other things. Or you can make these beautiful assemblies. Jing, I think, is here. Jing, this is your beautiful slide. Um, tiny little gold nano triangles assembled in this beautiful array, again, to control the optics. And one of the reasons um, it did take us so long, and Richard Feynman had a really good quote for this, is, of course it's able to do it. Theoretically, of course, we can arrange things atom by atom. We can do that. The reason we haven't is because we're all too big. Um, and he didn't really mean we're all too big. He meant our tools are not fit, and we don't interface properly with the tools to deliver that atom by atom assembly. Okay. I've only put two equations in the whole talk, but, um, and they're really simple ones. So, you know, really, really, just, you know, not even, hardly equations at all. Um, I wanted to just, just, to, just to touch a little bit on why is nano different? Why, why would metano materials be different to, to normal bulk materials? Um, and it's to do with the surface energy. So most of us, when we talk thermodynamics, we have some understanding that the energy of a system relates to some entropy term, a pressure volume term, and a, and a term that's related to the chemical potential and the number of particles. We always ignore the surface energy in classical bulk thermodynamics. But actually, the surface energy becomes important when you get to a really small size. So if you take this one centimeter volume of material as a single cube, you've got six centimeters squared of surface. Chop that up into nanoscale pieces, and now you've got 60 million centimeters squared of surface for the same volume of material. So the surface energy suddenly is a huge component of the material system, right? And surface energy makes systems unstable, right? The surface energy has to be higher than the bulk or everything in the world would collapse and form new surfaces, right? The world goes to low energy states, right? If the surface was lower energy, everything would collapse. So we're happy that surface energy is big, but it drives a certain type of behavior in nanomaterials that we have to worry about. The second equation is this one. It relates to the electrochemical potential. And actually, the electrochemical potential here linked to the Gibbs free energy means the electrochemical potential of any system is related to the energy. So it's modified for a nanomaterial. So if you were to go to a book and look up what do I think iron or copper or zinc or other materials that armors and brazes might care about, you will get a number of the electrochemical potential. That number is shifted when it's a nanomaterial. So it behaves and it reacts very differently than if it's in the bulk state. So as a general idea, if you think of a nanoparticle, something like 50% of the atoms in the nanoparticle are at the surface or in a surface site. So it's behaving very differently. It's not surrounded by lots of nearest neighbors. It doesn't, doesn't have very many friends. Right? It's sitting on the surface, disconnected, and, and in a high energy state. The second thing that's 
interesting is that the volume in these nanoparticles is contained in tiny chunks. And that means that thermodynamically you can do things to do with magnetism, for example. We'll give some examples of where the, the volume is important and the surface energy is critical. So we're going to talk about some of these areas and where, where my group has been using surface energy, for example, to think about controlling nanostructures. All right. So, as in many things in technology, there's a good and a bad side. So I'm going to start over here because nanomaterials, they're small, they've got this high surface area. If you want to make a catalyst, for example, with an expensive material, for the same volume, you can get tons of surface. Hit it on button. So that would be good. That would be a really good use of it. And they're very reactive. So that's good because you want to optimize reactions. Good. However, if they're small, they can get to lots of places. They can get to places like across cellular membranes. They can get into the environment. They can get into the food chain because they're small enough to cross barriers that bulk materials don't and they're harder to capture and filter out. They've got a high surface area and they're really reactive, so that means they're unstable, right? They are wanting to grow, they are wanting to be oxidized or, um, or yeah, grow into structures that are not what you designed them for. So the things that make them really useful as nanomaterials are the things that make them potentially dangerous and unstable, right? So you've always got this development versus responsibility paradox almost, or the nano dilemma, as I like to talk about it. And we're gonna talk about some of those issues in the next um, 20 or so minutes. So I'm gonna talk, start by just talking about that surface energy factor and how you can use surface energy to make interesting structures. Um, so this is, this is what we would call a, this is a very, very simple phase diagram. What this shows you is the solubility of zinc oxide as a solid versus um, zinc oxide, zinc two plus as, a, as an ion. All right, so if we are in this region for pH, you will find um, zinc two plus will dissolve. So zinc will dissolve, zinc oxide will dissolve at high and low pH. That's essentially the message. All right, so if you can control your system, in here you've got zinc oxide solid. Um, we're gonna use electrochemistry to make a zinc two plus solution deposit as a zinc oxide solid, right? And the way to, one way to do that is to use electrochemistry. So this half cell oxygen reaction is um, seen everywhere in electrochemistry, really critical for um, electrolysis, fuel cells. Um, and we're gonna drive this reaction very locally on a surface. So very locally on a surface, you get a shift in pH and you cause precipitation. Now, you could just cause everything to drop out, right? So anyone that's done a supersaturation reaction in school probably did it with temperature. Heat the temperature up, let it cool down, everything drops out, right? We are trying to control it in a threshold way so we get very specific um, precipitation. The thing you need to know about zinc oxide, um, it's a work site structure. That means it's got rows of zinc ions, oxygen ions, zinc ions, oxygen ions, zinc ions, oxygen ions. So if you cut that crystal in this plane, this here, which is now all oxygen, is a very charged surface, right? So you've created a dipole surface. This crystal surface here, positive, negative, positive, negative, is neutral. So the crystal doesn't like this surface, right? It's a charged surface, it's a high energy. So when it grows, it tries to minimize that surface. And you can use that change in surface energy to get structures that you want or might be desirable. So here's what you can do. You can play with that surface energy feature. So you can minimize the polar surface by growing the, um, the samples in a very controlled electrochemical way. And what you can do is get it to grow basically as rods, nano rods. These are about 50 nanometers in diameter. They go straight up. They grow aligned because the, the crystal geometry is determining the growth. And this direction also happens to be the optimum electronic conduction direction. So you're growing very preferentially conducting nanostructures, right, that align. So these are really interesting for interdigitating electronics, for example. You can actually then just dissolve the, solar, the polar surface. Solar surface? Solar polar surface? Who knew that was hard to say? Polar surface. Um, if you let this re-dissolve, if you change the pH so it goes back to dissolving, it turns out the sides here, which we've, we already did know they were more stable than the surface, actually, if you get the conditions just right, it dissolves just straight back down the middle. and gives you these beautiful tubes which are really interesting for things like catalysis. Um, 
you can then actually, it turns out, stabilize the polar surface. So if you add something into your solution, like excess chloride, it will neutralize the surface charge, and then the system likes that surface. So instead of the rods, you actually get these giant hexagons with virtually no sides. So you can basically change completely the dynamics of what's happening by playing with the surface energy. Um, and then this, it turns out, is the hardest one to do, making a dense fill. Um, this here, this layer here is zinc oxide, electro-deposited. Normally, if you wanted to make a thin film of zinc oxide that was oriented, so this is all oriented in this direction, you can just about see where the rods might have been if it was growing. Um, you would have to use a high temperature to crystallize it, high vacuum system to deposit it, right? Very energy intensive. If you get the conditions right, you can grow it at about 50 degrees C in an aqueous solution with less than a volt, right? So energetically, this is much more stable and you can do things like put it into these clever um, photovoltaics in a low energy fabrication way. Okay. So I just talked about going in this direction from liquid or solute, solute to solid. Now, it turns out there's a really interesting system, and it's biological, where you have lots of scenarios where you go from seven to about five. So five to seven takes you to deposition, seven to five takes you to solution. Right? So in biological systems, the extracellular pH is normally about seven, intracellular is about five, you're going to release zinc oxide. And I just told you that these particles were very small, so they can get across cell membranes, so they can go from extracellular to intercellular, and then they might well dissolve. And it turns out they do. Um, so working with... Um, colleagues in medicine in the National Heart and Lung Institute who've done a lot of experiments on the potential toxicity of nanoparticles. Um, thinking about what is what we make safe, right? So the rationale is we need to know what we're making is safe because they might get into the environment or into humans. But also, if we know what's a safe window, we design the right material right, for the function. Right? So you a priori start to make the right thing. So what this is, is that you can tell that's not a happy cell, right? You don't, I don't need to tell you that's an unhappy cell. This is a human macrophage cell, um, which is our immune system cell. It's gobbled up some nanowires and then it died. Um, yeah, I was going to say a happy death, but no, it died, died of zinc. It died of zinc poisoning. Now, zinc actually is a pretty innocuous material, a pretty innocuous metal for us. You've got large quantities of zinc in your body. What nanomaterials do is deliver a very high dose locally, all right? So you get over that threshold because it's all concentrated in the solution. And as um, the father of toxicology said, the dose makes the poison. Then we thought, um, actually, if we can make things die very locally, there's a toxicity issue, but potentially there's a therapy issue. Um, so what you're gonna see here is now we're still delivering zinc nanoparticles to cells, but now these are, but now these are breast cancer cells. All right. And we've put a chemistry on the surface of our nanoparticles to specifically target those cells. And it turns out cancer cells require a lower dose than our immune system. Right. So you found an envelope that's not toxic to the bulk host, but locally delivered, can deliver this toxicity. There's lots more interesting things in this slide. So green, when it goes green, that tells you zinc ions are being released. Right. When it goes red, it tells you the cell is dead. What you find is it only goes green where the cell is, so it's not dissolving extracellularly. It's only when it gets inside the cell in that intracellular lysosomal environment, it dissolves. And they all dissolve at slightly different times. Right, so this heterogeneity of survival actually is a really important characteristic of, of breast cancer, um, which we we'll don't have time to talk about. Um, we see a similar thing with silver nanoparticles. Um, what you're seeing here, this is, these are silver nanoparticles that have been exposed to lung fluid. Now, your lung fluid has got, um, well, it's one, it's acidic, so there's a slight tendency for things to dissolve. But it's also got lots of proteins that maintain lung function. And what the silver particle does, and you can see it wrapped around here, this electron microscopy image, proteins sequestered from that fluid. But it doesn't do them all equally. It preferentially takes some of the proteins out. What that means is it changes your lung function with time. Um, and it also... Oh, Oh, no, that wasn't supposed to happen. Okay. It also dissolves a little bit. And it interestingly dissolves a little bit. And, we, and in the lung, 
there's quite a lot of sulfur, and silver loves sulfur. Anyone that's tried to polish jewelry or polish silver artifacts, no, silver loves sulfur. So silver in the lung, when it tries to dissolve, meets sulfur and precipitates. You don't get any silver-free ions for very long. And it turns out that's a detoxification mechanism, this insolubility of silver sulfide. But you see it starts to dissolve, and then you get this, this cloud. So silver is not overtly toxic in the lung, right? but it is, um, can change the lung function if you're compromised, which is an interesting, which is a, a really important result. But what you can also say is actually, we know that silver has got very strong antimicrobial nature. And we can use the same thing we just did with zinc oxide. We can take the zinc, the, the silver nanoparticles, and deliver them locally. And what Tim Ellis was able to do is show that you can wrap silver nanoparticles in plastic, deliver them into the lung um, to look at um, treating TB and other antibacterial diseases very effectively. And combining that with conventional antibiotics um, causes an increase in cell death. Or you can incorporate nanoparticles directly into coatings on surfaces to, to make your surface antimicrobial. Okay. I'm I could go on all night about these. This is the last one I'm going to do. Um, pollution. So I've talked specifically about nanoparticles um, uh, in humans. But of course, one of the big areas where you're going to find nanoparticles currently in use are in things like cosmetic products, in detergents, in fragrances. Um, and they get washed into the sewage system, they get taken out into the rivers, and, and the potential for damage is quite large. Um, what you're seeing here is the freshwater algae. So this is work done with our collaborators in Bristol, Marianne. Um, this, is a, this is a happy one. This is one we gave some silver nanoparticles to. Um, and you can see the change in the structure. The, the nucleus effectively shrinks. The extra membrane starts to detach. So it's hugely impacted, and then, and then the growth is destroyed. But for all the same reasons that we saw in the, in the, the lung cells and the, and the macrophage cells, it's locally delivering damage. But nanoparticles potentially also have great benefit for environmental remediation, right? So one of the things we've been looking at in particular I'll talk to you about is, is using nanoparticles to do remediation of the environment. And we're going to go back to magnetite, which is um, still my favorite iron oxide. Everyone should have a favorite iron oxide. <laughs> um, magnetite, the clue is in the name. It's a beautifully magnetic material. Um, and here's why it's interesting. So magnetite is a very magnetic material, right? So we're probably, well, hopefully you've all used to a, a hysteresis loop. Um, I was going to say, Jonathan, everyone in this room, anyone in, in Imperial always pays attention to other fronts. So all the students here know what a hysteresis is. Don't know where you went to university. <laughs> ours, ours do actually always pay attention. Um, so this is a hysteresis loop for a conventional ferromagnetic material. And you can see, you know, you've got, you apply a field, you get a saturation magnetization, you reverse the field, and, and even at zero field, you maintain the magnetization, right? You have, you end up with, with, and you have to put an extra negative field on to depolarize or demagnetize the system, right? When you make your material very, very, very small, right? You contain all your magnetic atoms and electrons in a small volume. It does not sustain that magnetic magnetization when you remove the field, right? Because the volume is so small that just thermal fluctuations will demagnetize it. And you get down to about 20 nanometers of particle size, and you end up in this super paramagnetic state, right? So you've got, you put a field on it, it will magnetize, the spins will align. You remove the field, it collapses. So what you make with nanoparticles is effectively a magnetic switch, right? You put it in a field, it's magnetic, you take the field away, it demagnetizes. So being able to create a switch is critical to this, this process that we're going to look at. So here's a beautiful magnetite nanoparticle. You can see it's beautifully crystalline. We can also coat it with silica if we want to put it in something acidic, and we can create these really uniform um, monodispersed samples. The magnetization, it turns out, and you might expect, because we're looking at the volume, changes as a function of particle size, so you can control that very, very um, accurately. So, so here's the idea. You take some nanoparticles, you, put, you coat the surface with something clever. With this something clever, in our case, was based on phosphate, and because we know uranium ions. We think uranium ions. We hypothesize that uranium ions are going to really like phosphate. Um, you mix them together. You use a magnet to pull them back out again, and you've got clean water and your nanoparticles with the uranium. So that's, that's the idea. 
Obviously it works, I wouldn't be putting this in the slide, but anyway, no suspense. And it works amazingly well, right? So it's super rapid. You take the uranium out in less than a minute from the whole solution, right? It's all removed. It's very stable. So this is if you wash the nanopolis, because you might remove a little bit that's not touched, but then nothing else comes off. It's 90, 95, greater than 95% stable in the system. And what we were most surprised at, it's really selective. So if you put those nanoparticles into a mixed solution of, so here we use strontium, calcium, and magnesium, and we picked those elements because that's what some of the cellar field fuel ponds have, it only takes, so we started off with a bunch of stuff, uranium goes to zero, everything else pretty much stays the same. So you can design your surface, and your surface chemistry and your magnetic particle to go in, grab grab the thing you want to take out, pull it back out, extract it, and have clean water. Um, and, at the t and I think as of, as of yesterday still, this is the highest capacity loading uranium remediation system. And it's magnetite, which is very non-toxic, and iron is everywhere, so you might not worry about putting magnetite into the environment. I still would, but it's a nice, friendly material. It has FDA approval for putting into the body, so um, <laughs> it's a pretty good material. All right, so this kind of good and bad, I think, is really important. Not just, not just thinking about nanomaterials, right? Anything where you are developing technology, being able to hold at the same time potential good versus potential risk is really important. And, and it's really important that groups are able to look at both sides of any coin, not just the nanomaterials one. So I, I could have given this talk and only talked about batteries and fuel cells and catalysts and magnetic calorics and all kinds of other interesting nanomaterials because we do a lot of that in my group. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple of highlights. Um, <coughs> this is, where's iGram? These are iGram's data. I know, I love these data, I'm sorry. I, I sometimes, when, you know, when I'm feeling a bit sad, I come back and look at these images because they're amazing. So, what you're seeing here. Um, We've just been, I've spent a lot of time showing you nano objects, right, because, because it's really interesting to do that and see it. But when you've got nanoscale interfaces in bulk materials, they totally dominate the properties, right? So um, what you're looking at here is a, a primary particle. This is an NMC particle, nickel, a magnetic cobalt oxide particle, and that's the cathode in a lithium ion battery cell, one of the cathodes in a lithium ion battery. Um, and it's made up of lots of other tiny particles. And one of the big problems, well, one of the many problems with batteries, brilliant though they are, is the degradation of them, right? It's sometimes fast, it's sometimes dangerous. Right? One of the issues is cathode degradation and cathode cracking. So what we were trying to do is um, understand, let me go back and show you that again. Understand what's happening to these cathode materials as they are in the electrochemical cell so iGram has been able to take out individual particles and test their mechanical properties in an electron microscope. And you see here this, this probe, with thanks to Finn, who's like the master of all things nanomechanics. Um, this is, again, if you think about a human hair, this is less than a tenth of the size of a human hair. And we're using it, we're making it, and we're using it to crush the particle and measure the mechanical properties at the same time. And what you find is this, this process of intercalation in a battery, lithium ions coming in and out, in just a single cycle, drops the strength of this material from 180 about megapascals down to about 70. A single cycle is enough to almost destroy the mechanical properties of this material. So now you're thinking about cycling that for tens, hundreds of thousands of cycles, and the mechanical properties being critical to whether it cracks or is stable, these nanoscale interfaces, where the ions are moving in and out, are being weakened by that process, right? And you can see, if you look carefully, the pathway of this is a long, uh, those integrate, those nanoscale intergranular sites. Um, this is the last piece of data I'm gonna show you, and it's a little bit niche, and um, it's a little bit nerdy, but it's my favorite piece of, oh no, I can't say that. It's that doing one of these talks is like someone asking you to pick your favorite child. Honestly, I'm not. <laughs> I just, I, these, are, these, these are data, but it's a bit niche. So let me just walk you through this. So th what we've been doing is measuring structure using x-rays in surfaces and buried interfaces in, in oxide ion conductors. And what we are trying to understand is um, 
when you've got an interface between two materials, what does that structure look like and how does it change in operando, right? So if I've got an interface and that's where maybe ions are transporting and I put a field across it or I heat it up, how that structure changes will change the properties of the whole device. Um, so this experiment is something called the crystal truncation rod experiment. Um, and if you've been taught about diffraction, you will have been taught that you've got a Bragg condition and when you satisfy the Bragg condition, you'll get a peak and then you'll get nothing and then you get a peak and then you get nothing. Not true, right? Because actually when you put a surface or an interface in your system and you get your geometry right, okay, and this required us to do really hard reciprocal space, six circle goniometer experiments. Um, I'm putting it up here because it's a really hard experiment. What you find is there is intensity between the Bragg peaks and this comes from the surface or the interface scattering. Right? And so if you measure non-zero intensity between the peaks, that tells you something about your surface. And that's really important for understanding surface structure, surface dynamics. And we can do this in operando. So this is the Bragg peak here. The big guy is the Bragg peak. This little guy is going between the Bragg peaks and you're seeing scattering, you're seeing intensity over time until you get to the next Bragg peak. So you're going from here to here to here. Those of you with an eagle eye will notice there are two Bragg peaks here, right? What that tells you is my lanthanum oxide and my, my LAO and my STO are very crystallinely aligned, right? These are epitextual eyes, so they're Bragg peaks sit next to each other, right? But what's interesting is what you find out between the peaks, right? These are very hard experiments to do and they take a long time to set up and you need a synchrotron, right? But this is the right experiment to do to try and understand what's in a buried interface in situ. Right? You can't do that experiment if you take it off and slice it and put it in an electron microscopy. You can't get that experiment from a functional measurement. You've got to find the right measurement and they're always, if there's not a right measurement, you have to go make one, right? I think that's the message we should take away. So I am going to stop soon. I just wanted to kind of summarize um, where armories and braziers are in 2022. 700 years ago, you had iron, then you had some copper and zinc. You probably had some silver and gold for decoration, I imagine. Some silver, still good. Um, but actually, all of these materials are critical to a sustainable future, right? So thinking about um, iron oxide and zinc oxide and didn't talk too much about this. This is a super cool material, lanthanum, iron, silicon, um, magnetic caloric materials, where this interface in these materials is critical for controlling the, the properties for refrigeration. Nanoporous copper for um, CO2 reduction, potentially. Um, stars and opals for a sustainable future. Um, it is a material world, right? And we need to use materials carefully and we need to design them for careful use, like the armors and braces have been doing for 700 years. Um, all right, I'm gonna stop talking about science and most 700 year old organizations ought to be able to grant indulgences. So I'm now gonna take this opportunity to embarrass some people in the room. Look at me, you can see you, look at me. <laughs> all right, and, and I said small things matter, of course, the main thing, and small things do matter, and nanomaterials are brilliant, but people matter more. Um, I do, of course, want to thank the Amazon Braces Company for this chair and, and of course all the organizations that have funded this work over the last 24 years. Um, all the amazing students and postdocs <laughs> that have done actually all of this work um, and occasionally had to stop me going in the lab. Um, and, and I just said when I was putting this together I realized actually Fang, now Professor C was um, one of Jason and mine's early postdocs um, and I remember, I remember interviewing you and going, oh my gosh she's so good. We have to hire her. And of course she is, and now she's a professor. Amazing. Um, Imperial is an amazing place to collaborate. These are collaborators just at Imperial. I have collaborators outside of Imperial. This is one of the reasons it's great to work here. I have collaborators over the years from all faculties at Imperial, right? It's easy, it's brilliant, and I have amazing people to work with. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about mentors. Um, whenever I'm talking to early career researchers, they often ask me, who was your role model? Who helped you? Uh, oh God, who did? And, um, and I, I actually did this exercise. Some of you will go, oh my God, Mary, they're all old white guys. And, um, 
they, uh, they are. I mean, and, and unap unapologetically, they are. And actually, it's, that's an important message, right? I didn't need a female role model. I didn't need a female mentor. I needed people who valued what I did and helped me do more, right? And so I, I had this amazing crowd of people. So that down at this end is my early years. So my boss, my first boss at Brookhaven, who basically taught me everything I know about electrochemistry. Some of you are thinking, oh my God, he should have worked harder, but no, he did. <laughs> um, Carl Saratsky, not many people think that thermodynamics is beautiful and not many people can talk about it in the right way, but thermodynamics drives all of this and all of life. And, and Carl taught me about thermodynamics. Roger was my PhD advisor, and this sounds like weird advice to give to a student. And, um, and I did think it was weird advice until I didn't take it. <laughs> and then a three-year project seems to last a lifetime with people you don't like. So perfect advice. Dave Williams um, was um, head of chemistry at UCL when I joined Imperial. And, um, too long a story for all the support and help that Dave gave me in the early days at Imperial, which we're going to gloss over. Um, but any of you that know Dave will know that a conversation with Dave is just ideas, 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 ideas. When I first met him, I was at a conference. I was giving a poster, and he came to talk to me. This big, famous guy, and I didn't know he was a big, famous guy. He came to talk to me, all kinds of stuff. And my, my supervisor came up and said, so Mary, whatever Dave said, write it down. <laughs> and, um, and, and every time you meet him, you have a brilliant idea. Dave McComb, many of you will know Dave McComb here. Um, and, and probably going, oh my god, I can't believe Dave was your mentor. But Dave did something really important when I was um, still quite young here. And we had some big grants to write. And Dave said, Mary, you should do it. And, and there's, there's two things to unwrap in that. One is, he could have been the PI. And he didn't. He didn't. He said, Mary, you should do this. And two, he said, you should do it. So when you're an early career researcher, and especially a female career researcher, there's lots of, oh, but you can. You can, of course you can. And we all have that imposter thing. And can is important. But should is really critical, actually, because it implies an obligation to do something and, and what you ought to do. And it carries a little bit more weight. And what I didn't tell you was this was the Catholic school early on. So I've still got like residual guilt. That's a very easy, it's a very easy trigger to hit, right? So Dave knew this and used to hit my guilt trigger many times. Mike Tony, who's uh, my longtime experimental partner in, yeah, all kinds of experiments that we have done. Horrible, hard <laughs> experiments at synchrotrons over the years. And, um, and he just never thinks something is hard. And in fact, the harder it seems, the more excited he is to do that experiment. And Neil, um, what can I say? When, I, when Neil joined Imperial um, and he came in as director of research, he was immediately like a breath of fresh air in the department in that advice and just, just get on with it. And you've, said, you've given me many great pieces of advice, but. Um, uh, you're probably sad that that's the one I've chosen to put up here. <laughs> but, uh, but actually, I, I'd, I'd, I'd written tons of what I thought were beautiful grant proposals. And I sent them in. And they'd come back, and the referees would be like, oh, this is beautiful science. This is really beautiful. And I didn't get the funding. I'm like, what? Anyway, I showed them to Neil, and was like, Neil was like, yes, it is. They're really beautiful. They haven't got any questions with it. But so what? <laughs> Nobody cares about that stuff, Mary. And, um, anyway, so I wrote different proposals after that one meeting, and it turns out that I could, write, I could actually write good proposals. And, um, but thank you for that advice, and I now give it to lots of other people. Um, I call these people mentors. That's the wrong word. Um, this is the right word. They're sponsors. They haven't just given me advice in a cup of tea. Right? They've helped me write proposals. They've nominated me for prizes. They've written me reference letters. They've given me invited talks. Right? And that's what you need in research. You need those supportive people who can actually enable you to do things. You need people to give you a cup of tea and, you know, a shoulder to cry on, but you need sponsors. Um, we've all been demented, right, to death, particularly women in science. We'll give you a mentor. Give me a sponsor, please. Oh, last ones. I'm almost done. Um, small people matter the most. Um, I just wanted to talk about work-life balance and family. And um, I was once at a, a conference where we were, and I got, to this, I got to this old woman stage very quickly where um, there's lots of early career researchers and we're giving them advice and it was a, it was a um, Chatham House rule, so I'm not going to say who said what, but there was a really significant, brilliant Spanish researcher and an early career researcher said, what's the most important thing in your career? What was the best thing you ever did? And she said this. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> 
and she, and she was right. Um, if, if you want to be able to have a, you are here, I know. If you want to have a good work-life balance and have children who are happy and supported and be able to balance that, you need partnership. So be very careful who you marry. The second thing people often say to me is, oh my God, you've got children. Oh my God, how do, you, how do you do all that despite having kids? They say despite a lot. People say despite, despite having kids a lot. And, um, and my answer is it's not despite, it's because, right? And actually, having children changes your perspective. Um, it makes you focus. You don't have time for all the procrastination, <laughs> right? There's none of that. You have to get on and focus in life. And so they really give you a different perspective, which is super helpful. And, you know, and they start out small, it turns out. And then they multiply. <laughs> this sequential nucleation is, you know, my preferred route. And then they grow and they grow. And, they, and then we were in a rock band for a short time. Um, and then we were armorers. Um, and then suddenly they're really big. And it turns out you can't control those kinetics. <laughs> they just keep growing. But you can choose how you measure it. And, um, <laughs> make them look small again. So I am going to finish. As in most things of life, words are best said by a poet, and here's one of my favorite ones. Usually it's an Irish poet that says it best. Um, I shall miss you when you've grown. I don't think he was talking about nanoparticles, but he could have been. And um, I would just like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Mary, thank you so much. Um, I was absolutely delighted to have the opportunity of giving a short vote of thanks. Uh, and first of all, a very big thanks to the Armourers and Braziers for funding the chair that Mary has taken, but also for their continued support of the Department of Materials for many, many years. I'd like to thank you all for being here to attend the event. And finally, I'd like to thank Mary for a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Now, I've been asked to say a few, or actually very few words, uh, and I thought I'd take this, uh, I thought hard about whether to take the opportunity to embarrass Mary uh, in front of you all, uh, but in the spirit of transparency, I decided I should. <laughs> so 19, 1998 was a momentous year. My daughter Georgina was born, for example, uh, Europe agreed on a single currency. Well, actually, we didn't, but Europe did. Um, David Beckham got a red car again, card against Argentina. Um, a Labour government, do you remember that? A Labour government uh, was in power, uh, but far more important than all of that, Mary joined Imperial. As a new academic, uh, Mary was obviously immediately swamped with teaching, with MSc courses, and establish, uh, establishing herself as an academic. And here's the thing, it's really difficult to do that. What characterized this phase of her career, I think, was perseverance. And building a research team with so many other commitments, it's really very, very hard. I, I think a big inflection point came around about 2012, 13, 14, there, around about there. That's also when Mary became a professor in the department. And in the 10 years since then, Mary's trajectory has been nothing short of remarkable. Academically, we've seen from her talk that the work spans a range of different applications, both fundamental and applied. She's a world expert on corrosion, which globally costs us 
one trillion pounds per year. Well, so, could do, better, <laughs> could do better, must try harder. <laughs> See me. <laughs> Um, science doesn't get much more relevant and impactful than that. And this has led to very strong industry partnerships, which still exist. Her work in this area of science and engineering has brought many accolades, and this has meant more work. And I know it's said that if you need something doing, give it to a busy person, but I need to say no more. Her current roles, and these are the current jobs that Mary's doing, are the Armourers and Braziers Chair in Material Science, Vice Provost for Research and Enterprise, the Imperial College Strategic Lead in the Transition to Zero Pollution, the Director of the Imperial Shell University Technology Centre, and the Imperial Forum Policy Engagement Unit. It's a lot of stuff to do. But in particular, her role as Vice Provost for Research and Enterprise is a demanding role requiring external academic credibility and acting as an ambassador for the college, and I'm sure that we can all agree that we are, as a college, incredibly fortunate to have somebody who's so capable in this role. Now, on top of all of that, our external recognitions, with a whole raft of prizes, which I'm not going to go into, fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, for example, numerous invited talks, including the World Economic Forum at Davos, which was really good fun, actually, enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> and a CBE in the Queen's Jubilee Honours uh, this year. Finally, yes, thank you. <laughs> Finally, 30 seconds left and then we can go and get a drink. Finally, I'd like to focus on Mary as a person. Now, what really characterises Mary is her remarkable ability to engage with students, with colleagues, and dare I say it, even politicians. She's just never phased, uh, has that fantastic quality of empathy. She has a very strong sense of justice and will always do not what might be easiest, but what is right. And that's why folk trust her. And that's the essence of leadership. So we congratulate Mary as a scientist and an engineer, as a leader and a communicator, but av above all, as a great person and a great colleague. Thank you very much. That's it? That's it. I think there is a drink now. We, we are go, standing, we now we standing can, behind we you. We are in standing a here, yeah. ready to go out yes. and get a drink. So thank okay. you very much indeed for coming yes. along. It is. What is the origin of Sarah? Not not a long lecture, but uh, and what we the first from standard statistical randomization. Yeah, so the ideal randomization has been there for a while. There is a paper from the 80s, if I am not mistaken, that launched the idea, but it hasn't actually been used to study causal associations uh, until uh, some decades ago. So I would say around 2009.